Hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, the Deep Call webinar with Martin Split. Um, a few housekeeping items before we begin. Uh, this webinar will be recorded and it'll be available for rewatching, um, and we'll have it on the blog posted up tomorrow. So you can pass it to your teammates um, or rewatch it in if there are questions that are really important. There is a really short survey at the end of the webinar. Please fill it out. It's about today's topic and gives us some info on what we can do to keep making these webinars really fun for everyone and really useful. Um, and if you do have any questions, please put them in the questions box. So we have room for some Q&A live on here as well. We have some questions queued up for Martin, but if you've got a good one uh, or one that's itching, go ahead and send it over. All right, with that, I'm going to introduce Martin. Martin is a developer advocate and a webmaster trends analyst uh, in Google at the Switzerland office. Martin, how are you? I'm doing fine. I'm a little like flustered by the weird weather that happens here right now. Like we had a snowstorm and then like 30 minutes later we have sun and blue sky. It's crazy. So I'm in Colorado. It's springtime in Colorado, which means it was 62 degrees yesterday and it's nearly a total whiteout outside right now. So um, we could <laughs> just get through the webinar and have some Fahrenheit sunshine. Fahrenheit that's like 15-ish, 20-ish in Celsius, right? I don't know. I'm not a mathematician or a magician. I don't know why you would ask me number <laughs> questions. Sorry. <laughs> so we're talking about JavaScript and SEO today, and it's something that you and I both care a lot about and come at from different angles, but I've gotten the chance to talk to you and see you talk about it. Um, and I've recently gone to an Angular developing conference to learn more about it myself and to speak, which was really awesome. Um, and there's just there are a lot of questions and ideas in our community about how to leverage both sides. And you and I both care a lot about how to integrate both sides of the equation. So how to get SEOs and developers working together in a much more collaborative fashion, rather than having each team feel like there's a roadblock or a top down. Uh, so with that spirit in mind, I have questions. I have yeah. a lot of questions to you submitted by a lot of people. I hope I have answers as well. <laughs> um, <laughs> Fantastic. So I'm going to get this first one out of the way because you're going to get it every day. Uh, and it's from Rachel here at Deep Crawl. But I know you can't pre-announce anything, but is there anything you want to share around progress on updating Google's web rendering service along with the Chrome release schedule? We're getting there. Goals. I, hashtag, I goals. Have hashtag goals. Uh, so I hope that sooner rather than later I can say something about it. Um, I would definitely recommend keeping an eye on all the channels we've got, like Google I.O. and uh, Chrome Dev Summit every year is, is a useful vessel to like get things out. Um, if something happens on the Google Webmaster Twitter account, that's, that's useful to watch. I will get the news out as soon as I can, pinky promise, because, oh my god, I want this as well. As much as you all, we want this as well. So we're working on it. Uh, it's looking good, but you know. Yeah. Like the weather today, we'll see. Sounds good. Um, PSA from my side, don't download Chrome 41 to test because security is an actual thing, capital T. Um, had a little luck using the caniuse.com that helps understanding compatibility. Uh, but just because I've seen some security issues show up, don't go download that. That's not the proper way to test. Um, one cool thing, though, that can be used with JavaScript to help make sure there's backwards compatibility are polyfills. So can you talk to me about what those are, how you recommend mm -hmm. anyone on our teams looking at them or using them or testing them? Mm -hmm. So um, generally speaking, for a lot of stuff, especially if you see us mention polyfills in the documentation, we do that for things like Intersection Observer, uh, for Web Components, and I think what else do we usually say? I don't know, but there's like a bunch of polyfills that we explicitly mention. Uh, some of them are maintained by the Chrome team, to whom we usually go and complain if it's not working with search. Um, so like if it's an official Google uh, backed or Google supported polyfill, then you're pretty much in safe waters normally. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, Google is large and there's like plenty of people writing code, and that might sometimes mean there are issues, but usually we are super responsive. Uh, as a company as a whole, and it's all, always open source, so you can basically just go and complain on GitHub to the team that maintains it. Um, generally speaking, so what is a polyfill? Polyfills are JavaScript libraries that 
emulate and and basically provide features that the browser doesn't have natively, if possible. To give you an example, um, web components allow you to like register your own HTML tags, and then they behave like HTML tags that exist. Um, there's a bunch of stuff like if you will put some CSS into your your web component, then you can use a, a feature called Shadow DOM to mm -hmm. make basically constrain the styles within your um, component. So if you say like all te text should be read, that style is only applied within your component. So it doesn't leak out to the rest of the document. And the same goes if then something else outside says the text is green, it's not going to leak into okay. your component. So that's something that obviously the browser needs to support, right? Shadow DOM is a feature, is a browser feature, a relatively new one. I think it's now like two years old. It has been experimented uh, with beforehand, but like the latest feature is pretty much more or less two years old at this point. Um, most browsers support it, but what if you're on a browser that doesn't support it? Does that mean that my style sheet is, le is leaking? Well, you can use a polyfill that basically seeks these style sheets and then rewrites them so that it only applies to the web component and it, it does it in a way that other styles do not accidentally overwrite these styles that are supposed to be in the component. That's one example of where some JavaScript was written um, to, make a, or to make a feature available when it's not natively available in the browser. That's a polyfill. Um, there is a few examples where that works really well. Mm -hmm. such as the uh, intersection observer. There's a bunch of ways of doing that. The intersection observer lets you run code whenever a specific element becomes visible in the viewport, plus or minus a little bit of margin. And um, what you can do is you can you shouldn't put everything on a scroll handler, obviously, but like they are doing it in a really efficient way. And they basically test whenever you scroll if a certain element is, is visible. That ha hasn't, doesn't have the same um, performance as the native implementation, obviously, because it's JavaScript. It's additional code that has to run. It's not browser code that runs. But um, it pretty much mirrors, like it gives you the same functionality. The Shadow DOM polyfill, on the other hand, is not a really good example because it's really, really, really hard to encapsulate styles that way. So the polyfill might have some caveats, some problems that you might not necessarily know unless you read the documentation very carefully. So sometimes polyfills are great, sometimes polyfills are less great. The polyfill for Shadow DOM, the old polyfill for Shadow DOM had another problem. It was gigantic, it was really large. It was like 500 kilobytes or something. So then you have to like figure out, is this worth it? Is this not worth it? But generally speaking, um, especially with, with polyfills where it's pretty lightweight to do them, uh, like intersection observer, it's a good idea to use them because it gives a better performance or a better user experience um, to users as well as search engines sometimes. So polyfills, good idea. Polyfills, good. You hit on my other question, which was sometimes we see polyfills weighing more than the scripts that are needed to execute because they can be pretty heavy. So yes. For that point, just be cognizant and aware of the polyfills that you're using because there sound like there could be some lighter versions or partial implementation to keep it fast. Yeah. If you only use a certain part of the feature that you're trying to polyfill, use a polyfill that only supports that, right? Okay. That makes sense. Um, I'm going to back it up a little bit over the fundamentals. So Matt LaQuesta, who is in Colorado and a fantastic human being, asked a good question that I think everyone can can use some information on is what's what are the basic tool sets that you recommend for SEOs in particular to start covering the fundamentals of JavaScript and understanding how they affect page load? Mm -hmm. um, definitely mobile friendly test gives you a pretty good first impression and you can use it even on like local development servers or things that are not indexed uh, or off your regular domain say like you have uh, a developer pushes something in a branch and then you get like a URL that is very different from all the other URLs and maybe not even on your main domains uh, or even something that is on your developer's uh, computer. They can use tools. There's like a bunch of tools like ngrok is one of them that mm -hmm. lets them forward whatever happens on their computer to a URL that is publicly available. You can plug that into mobile friendly test. Uh, you get all the HTML that is rendered. You get a screenshot of above the fold content and you get JavaScript error messages. So not every JavaScript error means that there's a problem in rendering or necessarily like one JavaScript error might not necessarily be causing rendering problems, but it's a very good first step to get a feeling for what's happening with the site and you can do that early on in the development process. Basically, the rule of thumb is you want to do these kind of, you know, smoke tests where you see if there's, if you can see flames or smoke. Um, 
on your sites, on your pages. Uh, you want to do that as early as possible in the development process and as often as possible. So whenever you see a developer or hear a developer saying like, yeah, we are nearly ready to like deploy this or launch this, then it's probably already a little late in the process. You want to make sure that you're following the development process and say like, hey, is there any way where I can test this feature? Is there anything that yeah. I can like do to, to try this out? Because the earlier you see problems, the easier they are to fix. It's like building or constructing a building, right? When you when you see a mistake on the floor plan, you can just like take a pencil and just make an adjustment. If it's in concrete in the real world, that's a little late. So getting in the staging environment is really important. Yes, um, and, and mobile friendly test is fantastic for that. Then uh, the Search Console, the, the URL inspect uh, tool is great, but that means that it should already be in production. That's more for debugging something that you know has gone sideways. Optimally, you would catch this with mobile friendly test, the, uh, test a little earlier. Uh, you can also use the Chrome developer tools. Ask your developers about Lighthouse. They're probably going to be really excited to talk to you about Lighthouse. Um, and that's, that has some very, very basic SEO audits and performance audits. That's a really good tool as well. Um, and this is, so this is not a promotional webinar at all, but I'm going to talk about a specific case just because it was a quirky one that we found using DeepCrawl. Um, but what we've been doing is, is dropping a bot at the homepage with and without rendered JavaScript and just seeing what happens differently. And we've had a few cases that were tough to find on an individual basis, but were systemic. So whether it's performance or just um, what I've noticed is linking modules being executed with JavaScript, which is really tricky because it'll change the entire crawling architecture of the site. So for anyone out there, if you don't have access to the crawling tools, you can ask me to run one for you. I'm happy to do it. Or just make sure that you're looking, I would say every now and then, in using Chrome DevTools, the rendered and non-rendered version. Um, because those navigational or even just footer links can really change how the page is crawled. Uh, just between that first and second rendered crawl. All right, tell me what framework you like. So I see React versus Angular versus Vue versus... <sighs> What should yeah. we do? Does Google support them? What's a safe place to start? So the good news is uh, last year I spent quite some time looking at all the frameworks that are popular. And um, if you look at developer um, adoption and developer satisfaction, you see two clearly strong frameworks. That is React and that is Angular. These two are really, really, really widely spread and very uh, popular. There's mm -hmm. one up and coming. It's not quite at the same level yet, but that's Vue.js. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of developer good work goes into that. Um, the good news is I looked at all three of them, and all three of them work. So there's, they are not, on principle, inaccessible to search crawlers, or not, on principle, um, hurting your SEO efforts. So that's pretty good. There's actually, so if you, I'm not sure if you saw the video series that we have coming out um, every week. There's one more episode from the yeah. JavaScript SEO series on the Google Webmasters channel. Um, we are at episode three this week, coming out today, I believe. So probably after or during this meet, this this webinar, we're probably going to see a new episode. Um, and then I think there's one more, and then we are already starting to have the episodes coming out that um, tackle the individual frameworks. So we have one episode on Angular, we have one on React, and we have one on Vue.js. And um, all of them are great. It's just they might need different amounts of attention. So Angular, for instance, um, might be configured in a way that it doesn't ship a very important polyfill for a very important feature um, that is not supported in search. So if you see your Angular application just not showing up in search at all, and if you go to mobile friendly test and your Angular application goes blank in mobile friendly test, then there's a very high chance that you need to talk to your developer because it's, it's in the code, it's just disabled. They just need to mm -hmm. enable uh, the polyfill for, I think it's uh, array.fill or something. So like they just need to enable one polyfill that is by default disabled. Um, and then pretty much everything else that you need is built in into Angular. There's like the title service, there's the meta service, there's a bunch of stuff in Angular mm -hmm. that helps you. React, you just have to use that helmet that can bring in titles and descriptions. That's if the developer forgets exactly. about it, then... Yes. Yeah. So React by default doesn't need to have additional polyfills as far as we're aware. I mean, that might change. JavaScript frameworks change quickly, but as of today, you basically have everything you need except that for meta descriptions and titles, you want to use an extension like uh, React Helmet, as you say. Um, 
And then there's Vue.js. Vue.js has a few more things that you need to look into to make sure that you're doing things right. One is it defaults to hash routes. Hmm. It's a bad idea. You can easily change that. It's literally one line change. It doesn't hurt. Uh, I, I still hear some developers like crying about it. It's like, but what about compatibility? And I say, like, you're actually not having a better compatibility right now. You're actually not winning anything. History API is, is really well supported. Um, so you may need to make, make sure that you change that. And then you also need to use an extension for meta titles and descriptions, uh, meta descriptions and titles. Um, and I would recommend Vue-Meta um, that does that for Vue.js. But basically, all three of them are accessible. That sounds good. I um, Thank you, by the way. Uh, I have a, a few questions that follow on that. Um, I have some of my own, and Dennis Jensen asked a good one as well. So looking at the four main types of rendering, so server, client, hybrid, and dynamic, how far do they get you in terms of being compatible, or is there a preferred order that you have that people should mm -hmm. lean on? So if I had my choice of the four, best to worst. Mm -hmm. Best to worst, I would say hybrid rendering because it gives you a very healthy mix of performance, um, discoverability, indexability, and uh, speed, and, and user experience, because you basically, your hybrid rendering, the way it works is, you send the initial, so the server does some work, sends the initial content in HTML so that it starts rendering as quick as possible because the browser can stream HTML, but it can't do with JavaScript. Um, and then that also means that you get content into the first wave of indexing, right? Because it's in the, yeah. in the initial HTML. So that, that means SEO check um, and performance check because it's really fast to get the content across. And then it loads the JavaScript, and as the JavaScript loads, it enhances. It basically Mm -hmm. populates itself over. So like the links that you have in the initial HTML are regular links. If you click on them, you're going to get what a regular HTML link does. It's going to like reload the page or load the other page so like you get a flash of white and stuff. Um, that's not fantastic. But if the JavaScript kicked in or was downloaded and executed before you click on the link, that means that the JavaScript application can take over the link in the meantime. And then when you click, you get whatever transitions you have or whatever. So you get like the user experience that you you wished for, but you get the best of both worlds. You get fast and very very nice in the user experience, and that's that's great. Uh, not always easy to accomplish, um, especially in projects that already exist. Yeah. Then you have server side rendering. Server side rendering has the downsides of traditional pages that you don't have the like the nice transitions and stuff, and you might find yourself having to cache things, which makes things more complicated. Uh, it's the question like when do we generate the server generated version do we have to like do that once we deploy or do we have to do it more more often or do we do it on demand as someone clicks on the thing um but generally speaking again it brings you the content in html so you get in within the first wave of indexing all of these require code changes if that's something that is really hard to push through politically or because of resource constraints or because of developer like concerns, then a way to avoid all these quarrels is to use a workaround. This workaround is what we call dynamic rendering. What you do there is whenever you see a crawler access your server, you send that request to a renderer, like Rendertron, pre-render, whatever. Um, and then these would use a headless browser to actually render and execute JavaScript. And then you would take the HTML that was generated and send that to the crawler. That means the users do not get any benefits. They still have the client side rendered version, which is performance wise and usually not the best option. Um, that also means that uh, you have to somehow change your server infrastructure to route the request to the server, as uh, sorry, to the renderer. And um, but it it might might be much easier. It might be a much smaller change than changing the entire code architecture for your front end. So if that's the case, then you can use dynamic rendering as a workaround. But that's what it is. It's a workaround. You don't get the user uh, experience benefits that you get with hybrid rendering, for instance. So, so workaround, but if this case scenario, you can still get pretty far in terms of just the visibility and indexing. You, you get still pretty far with it. Um, and it's a good good workaround, but it's it's that. It's a workaround. And um, if you if you were to start a fresh project, I highly recommend if you are working with developers who favor React, 
point them at Next.js. Next.js is a framework that has hybrid rendering basically built in. It, it, it's a, it's what's, what we call a higher level framework. It uses React, but it does the hard bits of server-side rendering. Um, uh, sorry, hybrid rendering. And if you use Angular, then definitely tell your developers about Angular Universal. That might, for some projects, also be pretty OK to integrate in an existing project, but it's definitely easier if you start with Angular Universal. Uh, it's from the Angular team. It is maintained. It's a great solution um, for Angular. If your developers favor Vue.js, then there's Nuxt.js. It's like Next, but you ex uh, exchange the E for an, a U, and then it's Nuxt.js. Um, that's basically Next.js, but for Vue.js. So it uses Vue.js, but it also does the hybrid rendering for you. So that's a pretty, pretty strong point as well. Uh, might not always be easy to push for that, because especially if there is an existing code base, then it's pretty tricky to integrate that properly after the fact that you wrote that initial code base. Yeah, that's. I think it's useful, especially for people that we see that are looking to migrate or move over. Um, and just being able to cross those T's and understanding each platform and what we can do with rendering. Because there are a lot of difficulties in getting the two sides to work together mm -hmm. um, and hesitations on changing tech. Um, but we have a lot of questions coming on chat, which is really cool. Thank you all. Uh, some of these that aren't answered, by the way, we'll try to get as many as we can answered offline as well for the blog. So just a heads up, I'm not trying to pick favorites, but hey, I have two kids, I'm allowed to pick favorites. Um, <laughs> Taking a look here, let's see. Uh, there are a lot about site speed that I am going to put on hold for this talk specifically, but I'd like to know in terms of analytics, is there anything that we can do or we can look out for to make sure Google Analytics is working more smoothly with JavaScript sites? Um, for instance, like if they're using React and PhantomJS, they're still needed like an auto track or an event firing to get the analytics to function properly. That one came in from Dave Davies. So if you have any tips specific to that. Mm, so just as a word of warning, I'm not a Google Analytics expert, but I know I have done, so I come from a developer background, so I have done my fair share of uh, single page application tracking with Google Analytics. Basically what you want to do is, so each framework has um, the concept of a router. The router is a piece of code that, depending on the URL, decides which code to run and which content to show. So what you should be doing is you should find the way in the router that you've got that you are dealing with, and there's plenty. It's not just like there's actually multiple router implementations for some of the frameworks. So depending on which router you're using, this might differ a little bit, but basically you want to make sure that you find the central piece of code that, or the central point of integration where you can say, like, if the route changes from A to B, and the router will tell you what A and B was, what the route before and after the transition was, um, then please fire a, a event, a, a page view event to Google Analytics with, well, depending on what you're trying to do, but mostly you want to have the route that you're going to. So basically, you have to find the central place of integration in your router, um, and then say like, okay, so we're going to route B. So page, please fire a page view event uh, to Google Analytics with this. There's documentation in Google Analytics somewhere, and if you search for Google Analytics single page apps, you might find yeah. that piece of documentation. So when there's something like push state in the history API for URLs, even though it's on a SP, I can just fire an event. So every time I see that I can get a static track. Yeah, yeah. So whenever this, like, this, there has to be some code that changes the content. That is the code that you want to add that particular call to. Awesome. Um, all right, so let's look at a scenario. So this is from Diego Gallo, but on a single page app, what are the odds of Google assuming that pages are duplicate if one of them fails to render, if Google fails to render them? So the assumption is that the HTML is pre-rendered, um, so the non-rendered version will just show all content instead of the separate pages. So is there a risk there of Google just seeing it all as duplicate content? So I, I would be surprised to see a single page app where if it fails to render, you see all the content. That would be a very, very new one to me. Um, that, that sounds like a hypothetical example where something in the implementation has gone horribly wrong. What should happen is even if you, I mean, if you generate some HTML um, and that has no content in it, then Google will probably just ignore it. It's like, okay, this page has no content. So um, you don't have the issue of duplicated content. You have the issue of us thinking it's low quality. 
because it's it's a pointless empty page. It's, okay, it has some JavaScript yeah. on it. Cool, thanks. Um, yeah. If you do some server side processing and pre rendering or whatever, then you should make sure that for each URL you are rendering only the content that belongs to that URL. You should never render all the content in all cases and then use JavaScript to like throw away some content. That's a really weird use case. Um, the way that it normally works is your server spits out the content for the specific route, and then you might load additional content based on what the JavaScript does. In this case, there's not really a risk of us seeing duplicated content there. Got it. So going back to smaller websites, let me see who asked this question, because I think it's a really good one. Um, Patrick Barton, he's on the call right now, but he was asking specifically, would you recommend HTML and PHP for smaller sites um, over JS, or essentially, when do you recommend using JS? Because we know HTML5 does a ton of cool things. JavaScript mm -hmm. does as well. But if I'm someone starting a site or exploring new functionality, when do I decide to flip that switch and, and go bold and integrate more JavaScript into my site? So that's a very fundamental question. Uh, and it's not depending on the size. It's depending on what you're trying to do. So to give you an example of what I mean by that is if you are literally a JavaScript Si uh, sorry, a website that has like some, I don't know, 10 products or something, um, or if you even if you have like 100 products, uh, and you, what you do is you generate the content and you upload it, and the products change once every year or every half a year mm -hmm. or every month, then that is that's that sounds like a very static site to me. Because yeah. you're not having any dynamic elements there, really. I mean, yes, sure, you have uh, some products, but if they don't change the price and don't change their characteristics and there's not that many new products coming out every couple of days or hours or something, then what's the point of having a dynamic site? And then, then it's not a question, is it JavaScript? Should I do PHP? Should I do whatever? Then the question is, what is, what is the architecture that makes sense? There's things uh, called static site generators. If it's a static site that has information that very rarely changes, or changes in a very controlled manner. This can be a blog where you write a blog post or 10 blog posts every day, that's fine. But that happens in a very controlled manner. It's not triggered by a user interaction, it's triggered by you writing a blog post. So when you write a blog post, it's fine for you to run a command on your computer or to like mm -hmm. automate that away into like some, some cloud solution or whatever. But basically, you know, now I have this new blog post, so now I need to update my site for this blog post to show up. That's what static site generators are really, really strong at. And they generate static HTML and CSS and maybe some JavaScript to add. So if you if you saw my episode on JavaScript sites, yes or no, like what what is a JavaScript site? Mm -hmm. If you add JavaScript to, let's say, filter a list or something, mm -hmm. that's not a problem for Google because we don't care. We see the entire list. We're not going to click into the filter field and type something in and then filter things down. Um, you would have to create different uh, pages to have like this pre-filtered yeah. view for us. Um, but if your JavaScript drives the content, if all your content is generated by JavaScript because it's a highly dynamic site where people can click on things or leave comments or, I don't know, interact with stuff or post things or bid on things which changes the price or something like that, then a more dynamic website comes into play. And then it's a question of what are you trying to build really is if it's like a website that is fine to be a website that every now and then gets some dynamic inputs, then definitely look at some server-side technologies. That can be JavaScript. You can run server-side rendering with React, Vue.js, Angular. If that's what your developers prefer, go for it. If you say, no, I want to use Golang or PHP or Ruby or Python, that's not wrong either. It's just we don't care because these just generate HTML and we see the HTML and we'll be happy about it. And that's pretty much it. Yeah. Um, so you don't have to worry about these things. What you have to worry about is if you build highly dynamic things, like um, a, a page where I can, um, I don't know, share photos real quick and like edit them and stuff and then upload them uh, and then share them with others and publish them to the web or something like that. If these are the things or a like very dynamic bidding platform or something like that where the content is highly yeah. dynamic, then JavaScript web apps make a lot of sense because they give you all the power of like dealing with very complex business logics as well. If you have like a very complicated e-shop with um, like multiple discount systems and maybe like some social buying options and uh, a shopping cart that does funky stuff, I don't know. Then that's also something that is just very complicated to bring together. And if you then want an app-like experience, 
with transitions mm -hmm. between the pages and things, then you have to use some JavaScript to make that happen. So you are then you're in, in JavaScript app world or JavaScript web app world. Uh, and then it definitely makes sense um, to use use these frameworks. But the frameworks are not always the best solution. A JavaScript client-side rendered app is not always the best solution, but you can use things like Next, Nuxt, Angular Universal to build something that is dynamic on the client, but also still is like generating the content on the server side so that the crawlers pick it up quicker. Got it. Um, so if I do have a really dynamic site, like a yeah. new site or a, bid busy, or a bidding site that is just constantly changing, what's the best case scenario in terms of sending that second bot out to render? So I know that you know oftentimes it's given like a week or something like that for that first cycle versus second cycle to hit the JavaScript rendered content. But for sites that are extremely dynamic and relying on those scripts, is Google getting a little faster or compressed at doing those double visits and rendering? So that highly depends. Um, it depends on how we rate your quality and how we detect um, your site change frequency and your crawl budget is a, is a factor as well. So if you have, let's say, a crawl budget of 10,000 URLs per day, um, but you have a million pages that change mm -hmm. every day, then there will be some that obviously don't even get crawled fast yeah. enough for the changes to be reflected. And that's something, so while we say it can take up to a week or a little longer um, to for us to render your page, that is considering that you can't judge that. In the sense of sometimes these weeks, oh, it takes a week to render. That's not what happened. What happened is it took us five days to actually crawl it again. And then once we crawled it, we saw a diff that was large, in, or like we, we picked up on it and, and went like, oh yeah, this page is actually quite important to render. So we put it in the rendering queue. The rendering queue wasn't very full at that time. And then after a minute, we actually rendered your page. Okay. You still think, oh, look, this rendering took us five days. And that's not what happened. It's really yeah. hard to tell how long the rendering takes because you only see the delay until the content shows up. So you don't know, is there like, was it crawling or was it rendering that took so long? So the best case scenario is we crawl you relatively frequently, and then you might actually also get rendered quickly. That can happen. The best case scenario is a few minutes. Okay, so it'd sort of be like how we or how Google goes about crawling sites. If it's a highly trustworthy site, good content, you know it's fresh, you're going to hit it a little more frequently just naturally. Yeah. Um, fantastic. I have a question from Mihai, who is, a, who is a Google product expert and webmaster. They ask great questions, which I love here. But for hybrid rendering in and of itself, other than main content um, that we know we want to see server side, are there other items that you really prefer to be server-side, such as structured data, canonicals, href links, et cetera? Like, what are the key to make sure this is shown on the server-side and gets out there as quickly as possible? So, so besides main content, which is obviously the most important bit, um, if you give us a uh, structure, it's pretty much what you just said. Structured data is great if we have Smart it in the, <laughs> in, the, um, in the static content. Title, meta description is important. Canonical and uh, hreflang is pretty useful for us to see that. Uh, things like date annotations, if you have them somewhere. And especially structured data can be quite tricky um, because there's like a bunch of, of things involved in parsing that properly. So if you can get that into the structure, uh, into the static content, then that's definitely a win. Great. Um, here's, here's one that I have a question on that uh, Jerry Foley asks, or Gary, sorry, soft baddie. GIF, GIF, I don't know. This is going to start a whole debate here. But I have this question on myself, but de generating dynamic content per visitor. Um, and let's say you have a very personalized view based on that user and their path so far on the site. What are the concerns initially? And then I'd also love for you to talk about those sneaky 404s that have been difficult to catch <laughs> and really important to know about. Uh, the sneaky 404s. Um... What was the first part of the question? Because I completely zoned into the, the sneaky four of horse because that's a fun one. First uh, of all, how dare you? But secondly, sorry. it is uh, just about very personalized content. So if you have right. a dynamic yes. site. And yeah. then hitting that per visit. Yes, OK, aha, sorry, yes. Right. So for very personalized content, the first question you should ask yourself is, is that something that Google is going to see? Because mm -hmm. no. Uh, we not have cookies. We don't have session state. We don't have pretty much anything. We're we're stateless, so 
we would never see the personalized content. Um, and it's not particularly useful for users clicking on search results either, because if I don't have an account with your site, right? So like the personalization on Google is far less strong than people think it is. You're gonna see pretty much generic results. So yeah. I wouldn't worry too much about personalized content, but the cost of uh, pre-rendering or server-side processing or dynamic rendering um, per, per hit or per visit is tricky. So it can, especially if you do dynamic rendering, it can take such a, a headless browser a few seconds up to like, I don't know, mm. 12 seconds or something to generate the content. This, it depends yeah. a little bit on your site. Um, and that's gonna, I mean, mobile, um, sorry, not mobile, uh, page speed being one, or not page speed, loading performance and page performance being one of the over 200 signals that we are using, it's, it is mostly a tiebreaker, but still, it, you want to get all the signals right. So you might want to look into things like, can I write a script that hits the most important pages every now and then to like trigger the pre-rendering for us? Um, can I write a script that pre-generates the HTML whenever I, I change the content? Is there a way for me to find out when the ch content changed? Uh, can I use caching? Um, so you want to make sure that you can give us the and the users the page as quickly as possible and these performance like these 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 hits in in timeouts or this this hits in terms of rendering time that you need on your end um is something that you want to look out for definitely does that answer the question that answers the question um does that cover what you want to cover on sneaky 404s Oh no! Right, yeah, the sneaky. See, it's, uh, <laughs> I don't want to leave that part out. That's the, that I I find that use case really interesting. Sneaky so. four hundred fours are uh, that's that's a fun one. So the way that most most um, web apps work is that you have one request to the server. Um, that is the first request you get. Uh, normally, that's your home page because that's most likely where people land. Um, and that's, that goes to your server, fetches all the data, and then JavaScript hijacks the navigations. Mm -hmm. That can be because you use push state or you use a, a single page application router, or it can be service workers because service workers can also intercept and cache things in the background. That's how you get offline uh, availability, right? If, because if I go to a website when I don't have a network connectivity, then I still get the content. It just is cached somewhere. Um, so what happens is maybe maybe your service worker is really really smart and whenever I go to like say like slash products It doesn't actually go to slash products on the server It just makes the API call to get the product data and then feeds that into the JavaScript that was lo loaded when I went to the home page and then generates my products view so it looks like everything works fantastically great <laughs> the problem can be that if my server is not set up correctly for this kind of scenario for this kind of single page application use case, then if I go straight to slash products, the server doesn't know how to deal with that. It's not set up correctly. It doesn't know what to do. There's no such file as products. There's only index HTML. And if I wouldn't even see that. So if I have the service worker installed or if I, if I come from the page where I'm already uh, having the JavaScript running, then I would like, paste that URL in and then it will look like everything's fine because it's still yeah. asking the server. But if I send this to a friend of mine who has never been to that website and goes straight, straight to slash products, they'll be like, but I get a 404. Like there's no page here. The server says, I don't know what, what this is. Um, and that's that happened multiple times now that people came forward saying like, I think JavaScript and, and Google search do not work together because only my homepage gets indexed. And then I'm like, well, have you tried opening that particular link that you're saying is, is great and isn't, isn't getting indexed? Have you tried opening that in an incognito tab? And they're like, yeah. let me try that. And they're like, oh, oh, it's broken. <laughs> We're like, we see a 404. Googlebot sees a 404, so it goes, well, this page, there's nothing behind this thing. This is a broken link. Um, so you want to make sure to definitely double, triple check your server configuration. And there's an even more sinister because even sneakier um, soft or sneaky 404 configuration where some cloud hosters don't really support single page applications. 
uh, but what they do support is custom 404 pages. So some people, including including me, I, I'll be damn honest here. I'll, I'm always <laughs> honest in this in this kind of conversations, but this is like I'm making myself vulnerable because I had the task to make our single page app run from that hosting solution. And I'm like, ha. Huh. So it always goes to 404 because it doesn't understand these things. And we don't have all the, like, all, not all the routes. We don't have a products HTML. We don't have a whatever about HTML. We don't have a shopping cart HTML. So instead, what I do is I'm going to configure the, four, the custom 404 page to be our index HTML because then the JavaScript kicks in and shows you the right content, right? So as yeah. a user, everything works. Even if you would go into an incognito window and go like slash product, it works because the browser shows the custom error page and the custom error page happens to be my application, my single page app. So I'm like, yeah, we're done yeah. here. We are done here. It all works. It's a little, it's a bit of a hack, but what could possibly go wrong? Um, <laughs> and works. yeah, and then our, our SEO consultant uh, came to me and said like, we are not showing up in search. And it's all, all our pages are 404. And I'm like, that's not true. And then I realized, wait, that is actually true. Because our server responds with a 404. It, this 404 page just happens to be our application. So the user is happy. But the, the bot obviously goes, this is a 404 page. It's a very fancy 404 page, but it's a 404 page. Because the header response doesn't have to match the content. That's why we get soft yeah. corners. Yeah. So, so I mean, sure to give like a 200, OK. I just think of the route specific serving as, you know, for SEOs or technical SEOs, sort of the new version of conditional behavior that's a little tricky to catch. But if we yeah. figure out how to test it worthwhile, right? Something that we need to have in our tool belts pretty consistently. Um, on the issue of testing and catching problems, Craig Harkins, uh, he has a couple great questions. I really like this one, which is just, how do you automate testing of contents visible? Um, which I think parlays a little bit into, is there any other data that is planned to be exposed in GSC just to help tackle these JavaScript issues at scale versus one-off page testing? So we're getting these questions quite often. Um, and unfortunately, right now, we have nothing to offer in this, this regard. Um, your best bet is to, to use the Search Console API to see how many pages are indexed and how many pages get skipped or have errors uh, right now. Um, this is definitely something worth looking into. We're definitely looking into what we can do. But at this point, unfortunately, there's not that much that we can do. Specifically, the problem being the fact that Imagine, imagine this. If we would, the only way to give you reliable information is to open up rendering as an API. Yeah. That would mean everyone would constantly use our rendering resources, which means we actually don't have the resources to well render pages. So everyone says like, we want you to render our pages faster, but we also want you to give us access to your rendering infrastructure. It's like, what right, it is? It's one or the other. Um, so what we are trying to do though is um, as we catch up with uh, Chrome, that will become easier. Because as you know, there's the headless Chrome, there's Puppeteer, if you might have heard of that, which allows you to programmatically control uh, a Chrome instance and even do like things like get a screenshot and compare the screenshot to what you expect it to be and stuff like that. Um, right now, this isn't very helpful because you're running a modern Chrome versus what we are running. Uh, so that's not exactly useful. But as we catch up, hopefully soon with the modern Chrome, that will become a lot easier. Then you can use things like uh, um, Puppeteer for this kind well, of stuff. We'll include a link to that in the blog too, because that was a useful article that you posted, um, which is great. Uh, so I have a pet peeve, JavaScript based, but not necessarily rendering content that I want to ask about. So parsing is always this black box for me. I feel like Google gives us a lot of information on all other parts of the process. Um, and we use a parsing engine that I think is a little more strict than Google, but I run into this problem a lot where I'll see a script that'll then insert an iframe into the head tab. This mm -hmm. often happens with analytics programs, like Boomerang is my least favorite, uh, it's my least favorite company in the world right now because they're constantly inserting them into the head. But do you see any issues? So for most of our parsing efforts that we've tried and tested, an iframe in the head will just basically shut the head down automatically, so anything that comes after that doesn't really get processed. Um, 
is that what is happening on Google's side? Or is there a way to talk to clients about this or understand the risks better? Like, should so, we be concerned? Because I get concerned and miffed about it, but I also get miffed yeah, about the worthless things, so. Right. Um, <laughs> generally speaking, that's not even just a search problem. That's a general, that's the expected way of how the web works. So HTML is designed in a way that allows you to make mistakes um, by inferring what should instead happen. Um, one such thing that is in the HTML spec and that the browser does the exact same way, it's very hard to spot, but the browser behaves exactly the same way all browsers do. Um, iframes can't, by the specification, appear in the head. They don't belong there. How, why would there be an iframe? An iframe is a visual element that doesn't belong in the head, that belongs in the body. <laughs> Which means if I see that in the head, then the head must have ended and the developer must have forgotten to close the head. So the browser will be nice and friendly instead of like dying and crying on the user. It's just going to silently go like, OK, uh, the head is done here. So I open the body and then the iframe will be the first thing in the body. So that's what's happening. Um, which also means that then if I have, for instance, the title after this iframe, mm -hmm. The title will technically not be in the head, it's going to be in the body. And then the browser can say, I accept the title tag that is in the body, or I don't accept the title tag that is in the body. I think by specification, titles can't appear in, in the body. So I guess it might, uh, there might be browsers that ex uh, completely ignore it then. Um, this also means that if we expect certain things in the head, like certain meta tags or structured data might need to be in the head depending on certain factors, I guess. I'm not exactly sure if it, I think actually structured data can appear everywhere, but I'm not mm -hmm. sure if that makes any difference, but it might, I don't know. Um, not an expert on that particular but topic. But hreflang will be a key one that we see. hreflang needs to be in the head. And if it's after the iframe got inserted, then it's in the body, so we're like, this is in the body now, so it's not where it belongs. So it, there's something fishy going on, so this is broken, so we're ignoring it. Um, that's that's something that is generally a bad idea. And I'm, what I'm wondering is if that's a problem of documentation at the end of these providers, because you can also, nothing stops you from putting the script tag in the body or at the end of the body. It might actually be better for performance to put them in the end of the body, because that means yeah. that that everything can be parsed and displayed, and then the JavaScript is executed. Um, so depending on that, I would say be careful with third-party scripts. If they put something in the head that they shouldn't be putting in the head, then maybe they don't belong in the head. If they explicitly tell you you should put this in the head and it doesn't work if you don't, then that's something to raise with them, definitely, because that's, yeah. that's in inconsistent with what is supposed to happen. In my experience, too, every analytics program wants to fire their script as high up as possible. And I think without ammunition from the SEO community or from clients understanding, they just do it because they want to gather accurate metrics. And it's, mm -hmm. a, I mean, it's a pretty tough sale. But knowing that those shouldn't be there and being able to have some of that ammunition or know how to test for it, I think, is really important for us because yeah. we're just, I see it a lot, but more and more I'm seeing iframes in the head. And, you know, I get a little. Iframes don't belong in the head. No, never. Good, good, good. We're on the same page. Um, there are a ton more questions and some really, really good ones. I wish I had 17 hours to do this, uh, but I don't. <laughs> well, and you can always go to the you know, product forums is a good way to, to get some attention as well. Yeah. Uh, I mean, product forums, you have some active Q&A on Twitter, uh, yeah. the new videos that are coming out, and you can add comments in there, or even just making sure like the blog and documentation there, I can get questions answered there so people know where to find you. Um, and know how to get answered. But for me, I want to bring it back to something that's really important to both of us, and it's a bit more of a, my professional goal. I'm still really trying to figure out how to how to do this, but Craig asks, what do you think is the potential cause for the divide or disconnect between SEOs? And I want to know, how do you plan on tackling that in 2018, and how do you want the SEO community to support that this year? In 2019. Well, I mean, you could say 2020. <laughs> time for homework but let's just say in the uh, future so, so anecdotal evidence shows that i think both sides have been burned by black sheep on the respective mm -hmm. other side uh, that's definitely something i experienced as a developer 
that's something I observed other developers do as well. So like developers sometimes are resistant to changing the way they work or, or like to take a slightly more inconvenient route. Um, that's that's an ongoing discussion that we have in the developer community, like developer experience or developer ergonomics do matter because we can't be productive if we have to do very stupid things and don't have the tools to work effectively and efficiently. But that's not the most important thing. I believe the most important thing, and many developers believe that the most important thing is the user experience. And whatever tools allows me uh, or uh, whatever tool allows me to build great develop uh, user experience is the tool that I'm going to pick. But there are definitely developers, uh, especially those who are coming into the field or who are switching within the field. So like backend developers coming to the web, um, oftentimes start using tools that they love because they make them very efficient or they look very similar to what they used to work with in the backend. And now they have to learn new tools. So they, they look for the thing that gets them productive relatively quickly and they don't necessarily take the time to learn the fundamentals of how the web works and what makes a good web experience for the user and then they fall into this this trap of using tools that make them productive but do hurt the users and that usually also hurts oftentimes often uh, also hurts accessibility and seo and then whenever you come back and say like look this isn't great then they argue that but I'm really e efficient that way and I don't have the tool. That, that's a problem that we need to address. I don't have the tools to do good SEO as well. And that's something that I'm really happy to see frameworks addressing as we, we, as we talked about it, like Vue has the tools to it, uh, React has the tools for it now. They could be better, but we're getting there and you know, there's interest in the community from developers. Developers love the topic of technical SEO. They wanna understand how to make things better and make things discoverable because I no no developer likes to work on a website that no one sees. That's Fair. not yeah. something that's not something that happens. We want every developer who cares about their work wants their work to be used and seen. Um, and that's what SEOs, good SEOs, help with. Yeah. Bad SEOs instead spread fear and basically spread uncertainty and. Um, Something that makes developers very nervous is when you can't back anything up with facts. If I say you need to make the website green to make it rank better, most developers will be like, I don't, why? And if you say it's just the way it is, developers will be like, yeah, no, I don't, I don't think, can you prove that? Is there anything that you can show to me that backs this up? Because a lot of people, and that's in the developer sphere as well. We, there are people in the developer community um, just as well who, who basically make claims that they can't back up. And then you invest in what, what they say to invest in um, and, and make changes to your code or whatever. And then it backfires. And then you're like, okay, I learned my lesson here. I'm going to only do things where I have proof or at least like some reference that I can point to and say, like, we did this because X. And X is never because our SEO told us to. Yeah. They might do that if you have the power, if you have authority through power, then yes, they might do it, but they will never be happy with it. And they're never gonna go that extra mile for you. On the other hand, if you say, and that's what I'm here for, I'm trying to provide the documentation for you to say, look, this is what Google says, this is what you can do, this, this, is, this is the data that backs it up. Um, that's what we are trying to achieve, and I hope that we can, bridge this gap so that the the people, the bad actors in both communities do not have the same authority by lack of data that says otherwise um, as the good actors. So that's something that we work on and that's what I work on by doing talks and educating people and educating developers as well as SEOs, um, making these videos and writing documentation. So if you see like holes in our documentation, we're like, I think this is the way it is, and you said so, but there's nothing to back me up here. That's mm -hmm. something that I want to hear about because that's documentation that we are missing then. Um, we also want to build the tools for developers to better understand what the impact of what they're doing is. Um, so yeah, that's that's what we are trying to, to tackle here. We are trying to do uh, a, a way of like a translation service and like a reconciliation of the SEO community and the developer community. 
And let me tell you, the developer community wants to learn more. I wants love it. To do better. Um, I see and feel the same from the SEO community, even though I do hear voices that seem not to be exactly thrilled about the fact that, as it turns out, JavaScript isn't just the worst thing in the world and you can actually <laughs> build stuff with it. We're curmudgeons. Um... But the referenceable documentation is really helpful, especially that it's written in a way that combines developer interests and in syntax with what SEOs need to know in order to be successful. So that has been super useful for me. Um, I think that being humble and asking devs about their problems uh, is just a way to be able to come to common ground, what's most difficult for them. I guess that's the same with every relationship. Yeah. But coming to a developer conference and first Honestly, I apologize for some of the misconceptions and how rough SEOs can be, but uh, being able to get off on a neutral and positive ground has proved really helpful. And I would just say out there to anyone in our field too, and SEO is just that I think you become more valuable when you work across teams. Um, I think that developers that are aware of SEO basics uh, are invaluable to a lot of companies the same way that I think if you can be an SEO and understand how JavaScript or these newer technologies work and how to be an advocate and work with the developer team, you become a lot more valuable as well. If so. you're an SEO that comes to me as a developer and shows me like, can you implement this piece of code or can I somehow help implement this piece of code? That's fantastic. If you have a good developer on the other end, they all love that. Um, and cool. I think that's a very important thing. And the same goes like uh, developers will fight for you tooth and nail if they see that you're doing good things. Uh, and even if like the business or the marketing side might not agree with what you're doing, if the developers feel that's the right thing to do and have the data to back it up, then they definitely are on your side. It always felt almost like a handicap knowing that I wasn't a dev. Um, but I love technical SEO, but I think we're starting to see the benefits where if we can translate between the business and marketing side and the devs, that's a pretty unique and awesome seat to be in. And, you know, challenging ourselves, uh -huh. the world that I'm in now, there's a pretty big emphasis on education. So I think that if every tech SEO could go and try to labor through making a JavaScript-based website, really small one, just understanding some of those problems and how to troubleshoot them is super helpful. Um, and then send me, send me all your test sites, too, because they're kind of fun. <laughs> um, fantastic. I have a few more housekeeping items. So just a reminder, it's recorded. It'll be on the blog tomorrow on Deep Crawl. If there's a short survey, please fill it out because we like doing these, but they're only useful if they're great for the community. Um, and Deep Crawl wants to keep doing that. For the next webinar, we'll be inviting Nick Wilson from Vodafone to discuss how he uses dashboards to monitor SEO issues in really big websites. Um, and that'll be on the 24th of April. Time zones are confusing with daylight savings, but that should be 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And I'm gonna let all the translations for time where you are just be handled on back end. But we'll have plenty of reminders about that and you'll see, uh, you'll see an invitation on the email server that goes out too. How but, we all use UTC. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, time zones are hard. Um, yeah, it would be nice not to have daylight savings, especially staggered, but here we are, and we made it. So, Martin, thank you a thousand times over for coming at the end of your day, and I hope you have sunshine on the bike home. Um, but, yeah, this is really awesome. We, you know, this is a really great message, and I'm really glad that you took the time to come and talk to us about it. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you so much for all the fantastic questions, and I'm always looking for feedback, and uh, if there's anything we can do to help either developers or SEOs, I'm here for it. Oh, you're going to get taken up on that offer. I like it. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks, right. you guys, and, um, yeah, we'll talk soon. Have a good Thanks, one. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.